10 and 7 sixteenths. Hmm. Because I don't have Greg today, uh, he left me, I'm going to have to do all this framing myself, which is some larger length, big lumber. I got to frame the porch in because if I don't do the framing now, we're going to cover this with house wrap. Um, I won't be able to access the framing. Also, I need to dig porch holes for porch piers, for the concrete piers for the porch. And once I do that, it's hard to get my mega deck through this wall. So I've kind of got a step by step process I'm going to take today. I'm going to try to get the walls framed around where this porch is going. I'm going to then try to dig my holes, call in a concrete truck, uh, set my tubes for the, um, the piers. And then while waiting for the concrete truck, because I don't assume that they're going to be right on it. I mean, they might end up showing within the hour, but I'm going to then work on framing the 24 foot wide by 14 foot tall overhead. All things that I really wish Greg was here for because it definitely would be nice having either an extra set of eyes while digging the holes or an extra set of hands dealing with larger lumber. But anyway, he's not here. He left me. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and just do what I used to do, which was fight it all by myself. All right. So because I don't have him, I'm going to go ahead and do some, what I've found to be helpful, give myself some reference marks because I need this board to end up on the end of my wall and I'm not going to be able to see it while also holding it here. So what I've done is given myself a couple reference marks, which should help me out. Okay, so if that's worked, I'm flush over here on this end. That's, that's what I wanted. So that, that worked out pretty good. And what this is basically for is our porch is going to get framed through this and we need just material behind it for flashings and trims and steel. And it just is easy to throw a, to throw a two by 12 in here. So I don't have to be perfectly precise with where it's at. Hmm. Since I don't have Greg, we're just going to use this board here. We need to get some framing up top for where the porch dies in so that we have a place for our trims. And I've already done the math, so I know exactly where that's going to be. We just got to go up and put it in. So I'm just making a mark arbitrarily at seven, ten and a half. And then I can transfer that mark to the middle of this guy. That way when I hold it up, I don't have to check that end to make sure it's flush. I can just line it up with my marks from the middle, put a screw in it. And then we should be right where we need to be. I feel like I officially became an old man when I, uh, I brought a spare can, uh, coffee can of nails that I found in my shop because I was out of 20 pennies. So what we got to do here is add some blocking because this is where our porch trusses are going to land on the wall. And since we're going to have house wrap over this whole thing, normally you could attach them to your directly to your post, but this just gives me a nice place to land my two by and then have a bracket holding it um, onto the wall. So here in the front, this porch goes down the side wall, but then it gables out of this wall here. So we're going to have to do some framing down here, but that board we put up there for our uh, connection trims where the roof dies into the wall. We don't have that here. We've just got to do a gable frame. So it's going to come around this corner and then it's going to come back down to about right in here somewhere. Okay, there's my mark. Let's see if we can get this here. All right, did we do it? All right, we're perfectly flush, so that is good. I have to use the power of leverage since I'm by myself. There we go.
I'm sure glad Greg ain't here because I'm pretty sure he was supposed to attach these columns. He did that one over there, but huh? I'm surprised the building hasn't fallen down yet. That's a, that's a joke, by the way. This column, this column doesn't mean anything. End wall columns are kind of, well, it means something for the garage door, that's about it. Inch, one half rise, four inch pitch. Dial 83, 13, 16. Go right through this. I thought I'd get lucky and get rid of that ugly part of the, the board. Good thing this is just a backing. All right, now if my math is correct, and I, I hope it is, this should fit right in between these guys, as long as everything stays perfectly parallel, because um, if it's not, then it won't fit. But let me just think about this. So what I need to do is this right here is the point where my fascia dies into the wall. So my fascia is a two by six like this. And this is the point where it angles back up to the gable. So what I need to do is just, oh, you know what? I'll take my Martinez. I hope this is set up correctly. It is not, it's backwards. I want it to be like that. You know what? Good time to show you guys how cool this is and how easy it is to set pitch like effortlessly. And we're gonna flip this one around to the other side. Just has a nice little like push button release. Oops. Come on. And you flip these over so that one is always pointing to the right numbers on both sides. Slide it back over, go till it's basically tight. Cause you don't need to over tighten this. And now we have the right pitch. So this is the 412 pitch. This is exactly where my roof line is gonna be of my framing. And I want to, I basically just need to be just a little below that because all this is for this two by 12 that I'm putting up is basically just so when I have my steel come down, where well that does fit in nice, the wall my roof line is going to be here. I want a place to have my flashings up against the wall, something solid, and I want to have a place to, to screw my steel up this roof. My flashings are about five and a half inches. So if I move this out to let's say uh, eight, by the time I go up on my sheathing on the roof, my steel is a one inch, I'd say that's pretty good. We're not looking for anything. There's nothing that needs to be super precise. It just needs to be here. So I need a screw gun. And I know what you're probably gonna think. You're like, oh my God, this is, is this really your framing? Like there's nothing real structural here. Yeah, I mean, there really isn't. Uh, I, I could add some more structure if it makes you guys feel good. And sometimes I'll put like a board behind here to, cause it's really hard to get this connected. Um, but like I said, all I'm doing is putting this here mainly to support a place to screw my steel to. There, so now I got a place to screw my steel as it comes in. And I'm gonna have actually more framing tying into this, but for now I just need this here before I house wrap this corner. So right there is the peak, and then it goes back downhill here. So if I just take this scrap piece of two by 12 I cut off, it can become my, I guess, backing up here. Okay, now we gotta do a similar, well, let me think about that. No, I don't. I do not need any blocking here, I don't think. All right, blocking done, that'll be that way if I got attached something here, that's done. This is all ready for house wrap. Let's go ahead and dig our holes, get that prepped, and then we'll move on to the, the overhead door. But 
I'm gonna go in that Kubota because it is extremely muggy out today and the Kubota has air conditioning. So I might go turn that on and take my time digging some holes. I don't want to cover my X's and drive over them and I won't be able to see where I'm going. Greg, where's the shovel at? Oh, Greg's not here. What do you know? I'm gonna assume that these aren't gonna be as perfect, but it is reassuring when I can see my paint line on the ground and I stayed pretty good, so that makes me feel good. Even though Greg's not here to help me eyeball it, which can be somewhat challenging. Can't sit in that air conditioning all day. Okay, so now that I got those all cleaned out, all I'm gonna do before I put my tube in, just like our other holes that we did for the building, I'm gonna try to stamp as much of this loose dirt down as possible. That's tiring. Probably this air quality though. It's got me breathing hard. It's not my out of shape 40 year old self. Okay, whoo. Time for some tubes. All right, so with these piers, I'm going to come off this door since this is kind of our zero mark, top of finished floor. And out here, your porch, you're gonna want it to be lower than the door. You don't want it to be flush with the door because wind-driven rain then has a chance to drive it into this threshold. So what we do is we're gonna plan on this being dropped an inch and then an inch of slope. So in theory, our pier needs to be six inches top of pier from here. So what I can do is I'm gonna set this at zero on my grade stick. We're gonna find the laser. Okay, now with the grade stick, we're gonna be minus uh, six inches, right? So now I can just take this, go minus six on my stick. And so now the top of my pier can be minus six. And that should be good for putting the, the, um, the actual porch cap on top of these piers instead of around them. We don't, we don't want that, so. All right, let me get my tubes. All right, well, uh, no problem getting concrete out today. Called them and they said, yeah, we'll be right out. You never know in the summer, it's hit or miss. Uh, but looks like we got them out here pretty quick and we'll get these poured. Should be pretty easy. This is one of my favorite drivers too. So we got about a third of a yard, maybe a little bit more going in these holes. And nice thing is I can kind of control when that sucker gets turned off. Get him empty so he can move to the next hole without a ton of creep in the back of his uh, chute here. Oh yeah, that's nice. I want these to be fairly flat. I'll probably come back and hit this again. I know I'm not using the right tool for this, but I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a polished floor here, guys. Yeah, this is probably a little bit drier than if we were doing this whole uh, building site and I was trying to wet set these. But since I'm just gonna be creaming up the top, smoothing it off, this is perfect. I can just go about my way and get her done real quick. And the less moisture in the concrete, the harder it will be, less shrinking and cracking. I'm gonna try to do as much prep work as possible before I go up there because uh, 
the less material I got to hold up, the more I have already pre-cut and marked. I think it's going to be a lot easier for me when I have Greg here. It's not a big deal. We just put things up and, and as you'll see, um, go to some string lines and stuff for this garage door header. So we always use structural end trusses. So when you look at our end trusses, they're going to still have the, the structural webbing that our intermediate trusses do. We just have them add end framing so that we can apply steel to it with horizontal girts. So with that, we don't really have to worry about an actual structural header like a big LVL or a steel I-beam on this 24 foot door. We just need to make sure that the door header is structurally sound uh, for like wind loadings and to support the weight of the, the door opener kind of pushing and pulling that door open. So um, what, we, what we do is uh, just frame down a header. So you're gonna see that. So what I'm doing is cutting my, what I call extensions. They're gonna come from the top cord of the truss down to the bottom of the door header. And that's what's gonna tie it all together and give it that structure. So I'm just doing a little bit of math, trying to figure out how much I can cut off of these 16 footers so I'm not having to handle 16 foot lumber. Uh, 22 feet, four inch, one half. So we're basically making like little columns, really. We're just gonna make mini extension columns. Uh, and that's gonna tie in the structure on the top cord to the bottom cord to the header. I think it'll all make sense when you see it go together. Our columns are laminated and milled to five and three eighths. That way they can make them consistent widths, which means that anytime we're adding framing with standard two buys, they're a little bit thicker. And I know you're probably saying, dude, you're only shaving a little bit off. Why not just use them? Well, because it just makes our job easier when everything is the way it should be instead of trying to fudge things an eighth inch here and an eighth inch there. All right, I think that's mainly the lumber I needed to rip down. I might have to rip down one more. We'll see, but let's load this all up into the lift. I'm gonna get another drink of water because I'm absolutely dying here. And then we'll try to start installing this thing. Oh boy. So I'm just laminating these little fake stubby columns together. Just so I have more meat to uh, attach this header to. And you're gonna see what these are for in just a minute. That is my center point right here of this column that I, I just laminated. And it's gonna go all the way up to the top cord and then it's gonna get fastened all the way down here and it's gonna hang down to be the structure to hold my header together. Um, and I can figure this point right here within some level of accuracy depending on what this truss is doing. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna use math real quick. 22 foot, four inch, one half run, four inch pitch. So from this point to the top is seven foot five and a half plus the heel height of my truss, which is 15 and a half inches. So it's eight foot nine. So what I should be able to do is on my little stubby column, I should be able to mark eight foot nine. So what that's gonna do is give me a place to know right where this guy's supposed to be installed. And center, you know what, I'm an idiot. I put a screw in the center. It doesn't work when you've got two boards. Okay, that's better center. So we're gonna go ahead and hit this. And now, I'm gonna get this all fastened up, but now this is, this is what our header is gonna attach to. It's gonna come from this post to this guy, to that guy. And I don't know the exact height location here. So I'm gonna have to figure that out and get it cut off, uh, but we'll get all these installed and then we'll get a snap line from this end to that end where we want it based off of those posts where we have um, some marks, which were all shot with a laser. That way we can ensure the header is, is level and then We'll kind of go from there, but I'll get all these mounted and then we'll go up and we'll attach these all the way. If we don't get rained out, I can hear the thunder.
Yes, that does make it a lot easier. Just having a physical stop, so I'm not trying to hold it so precisely. Come on, right there. Oh boy, nope. Hey Greg, just, uh, just take your hand and throw it right there. All right, now if I did my math somewhat correctly, yes, my top of my board is right here at the peak. So it's like perfectly uh, the right height. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put a screw in here just to hold it. If I can just see the center there. So that gap right there, I need to get this truss drawn in nice and tight and uh, you're just not gonna do that with a gun nail. So we can either screw it off, which I might have to do a little bit of screwing, or we can pound in some nails. So this is still somewhat loose. Okay, so we'll just work our way down. I bet you a lot of times people assume that I'm missing the actual lumber, but when I get close, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm pounding next to the nail and it pushes the lumber in on that ring shank and then I can drive the nail again. Sometimes it makes it easier than just constantly hitting the head of the nail. So it's just, I don't know, something I've over the years noticed that sometimes as you, uh, if you got a big gap here with a ring shank, it'll hold the material. And if you kind of hit it in, it'll kind of bring that head back out and then you can kind of slam it home. Maybe I'm crazy, I don't know. So right there, see that? It didn't do a ton, but it separated the head from the material and then you kind of come in and set it and that's, gonna, that's what's gonna really tighten up. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. All right, now, now that these are here, I mean, these things are nice and solid and we don't even have all of our permanent kicker bracing in but uh, what I gotta do is cut them to the exact height so I can install my header. What we've done is this girt right here is installed to the bottom of our header. That's why it says header and there's a line there. So what I've done is I've marked up inch and a half. I'm gonna take my snap line and I've got an inch and a half mark on, oops, this end. Just gonna stretch it nice. Now this is going to go to that post and go right up to this guy. Now it looks to me like this is off a hair, which we knew. So I'm just going to go ahead and screw it anyway. So I don't have to hold it. If it's off an eighth, it doesn't really matter. This is just giving us our structure. Um, there's nothing that we're going to use that for to determine anything else. So it's really okay to be off. Um, I'm going to do a, just a, I don't know what you call this, just a, an open splice here. I'm not going to, because you'll see there'll be a lot of framing here. I'm not worried about this splice. All right, so now that we have that there, what we're going to do is uh, we've got these two by 12s and we're gonna come from the middle here and we're gonna go both ways. Um, to create just kind of an outside frame. Let's go ahead and get this guy. So we're just gonna flush up the bottom of this header. Don't come off, please. That would be miserable. This is that splice I was talking about. Now you kind of see why it doesn't really matter that it's kind of in a wild place because we're gonna be doing a two by 12 inside outside and there's nowhere for it to go. It's just giving us a basically a stiffener inside uh, that header so it doesn't flex around. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and run some real nails through this into these stub columns. Now there's a lot more nailing that I'll probably do, 
I'm just trying to get everything connected before this storm comes. So now you can kind of kind of see the header that is starting to develop. Um, it's not structural from like load bearing. We just need it to be nice and strong. So when the door pushes and pulls on it, um, it's not gonna go anywhere. And we still have a lot more framing to do, but I don't know how much I'm gonna get done today with the weather. So we might just kind of nail this all up. But then again, we're gonna have to go inside. So we'll see. did really good. National Weather Service issued severe thunderstorm. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. I'm gonna throw a couple screws in. That way it's there, it's ready to go. I gotta get some more fasteners. Anyway, I'm thinking for the sake of the video, you guys now see kind of how a header's built. What I'm gonna do next is run a board from this post here all the way over there. That way I've got a solid board going through this joint right here. So it'll cover the middle. And then that gives us two foot of header for the garage door, springs, uh, opener mounts, all that good stuff. But that's not gonna get done right now. We're gonna go ahead, get our stuff cleaned up and get out of here before that severe th thunderstorm hits. I don't wanna get caught in the middle of it. All right, we got a new day and my good buddy Greg is back. Greg, you missed out on a lot of fun, man. The other day it was gorgeous weather. It was. So even though Greg's back, I, I've now got, he's working on other things because like, now that this is all kind of here, I can just set my wood up here and I don't really need help. But uh, the good thing hopefully is that we'll We'll probably move through some work a little bit quicker. We got a lofty goal of stuff we want to get done um, today. A bunch of miscellaneous stuff we're still trying to wrap up before we start on the porch frame over where we poured those piers a little bit earlier. So, uh, boy. hopefully with Greg's help, we get, we get a lot more stuff done today. That did pretty good. We're just kind of laminating the inside and outside two by 12s to this center board now. And I like to use nails once I've got it all put to where, you know, I think it should be. The sun is right in my face. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have a lot of uh, sweat today, Greg. I can already feel it like in my, uh, and yeah, I was thinking something else, but I brought it because it was full of 20 pennies. Oh. So I brought it and then I was like, wow, dude, I feel, I feel like this is only something you do when you're either like a dad or a grandpa mm -hmm. is you have to have your, Hill yep, your, your coffee can full of fasteners. We got one more window to frame. And then I think when we wrap up this door framing that Greg's doing, he's doing all the blocking here. So we got to fill all this space in and have a nice solid place to put our trims. And then I think, Greg, I, I think that we'll finish our framing. Hey Greg, I'm glad you're here, dude. Could you line me up down there? Greg, did you not cut all the pieces up for the windows? Greg, can you hold this? I kind of like that. Thank you. So you guys remember when we put these trusses up? Greg had the bright idea, well, it wasn't really his idea, but he just remembered first, 
um, <laughs> to snap lines on the end of this truss. That was so when we got to this point, we don't have to do any figuring. This trim goes right to that snap line. So this is pre-cut um, soffit done by MWI. MWI uh, takes the steel from our metal supplier. So this is the exact same black uh, 29 gauge metal. And then they roll form and cut these pieces so that we don't have to. So instead of getting like a 12 foot piece of soffit, having to cut them all down to size, we just build our, our structure with a two foot overhang. And then uh, this is perfect for it. So we're using our crown stapler and this is the new Metabo. It's pretty sweet. It's uh, got a great tip for soffit. We were kind of afraid of it, remember, Greg? You, th you said, you said, that's not gonna be good for soffit, it's too big. And then we get here and it literally fits like perfect. I'm one ricochet away from never seeing my beautiful wife again, Greg. Oh yeah, I brought, so I brought those because I found half a bag when I was here by myself. Look at that. Look what Greg was trying to do. He was gonna sabotage me and make me look a fool by using dark blue screws. I tried. You know how many times I've messed this up in the past? A couple times. Yeah, because I go the wrong way. Now, this is important, depending on what snip you use. If I use my greens here, it's gonna push the left side down. Greg, aren't you holding it? I am holding it, I'm not holding your end. Down, so that I can get a nice, uh, this side will come right over here. Otherwise, if I would use my reds, it would have put this side on top, and then I would have had a really crappy looking miter. It doesn't need to be much. You are correct. Well, you know, I should have just, should have just grabbed a nail. Oh, I guess we're good. No, I need to get that down lower. Down there, come on, get in there. Come on. Oh yeah, let's go. Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. All right, so check this out. We're gonna put this screw in, and I get this question all the time: why we do this? Uh, and that is, why do you screw your trim, unscrew it, and then? put the screw back in. So when this screw goes in, hopefully you'll see what, I'm, what I need to do. Okay, did you see that? Do you see how it pulled the whole trim down? If I continue to screw it in, a lot of times it's still under, under some tension. So did you see that? Just relax. And then I can put the screw back in. If I don't do that, and I leave tension on the, on the steel, like I get it bound up, then what you can get is oil can. Oil can is when you look at a, metal trim or a roof and you see all the waves, that's because that piece of steel is not laying flat and relaxed. It's under tension. So by, by taking my screw out, I kind of let it go back to natural and then I just kind of just lightly put it back to where it's snug. So hopefully that helps people, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of work traveling around and that, that tip could be useful for a lot of people, I think. As in, I see a lot of oil can on trims. So one thing we do with our this fascia trim here is you'll see this guy ran underneath and long and also in the direction that you don't, or you're not gonna be looking from this side mainly, you're gonna be looking from my left because that's the front of the house, front of the property. So now we come in and we put this piece here and that is so the lap is covered up. So when you're on this angle, mainly looking, you're not gonna come over here and see this shadow line, but also because that's under lap like that, it just gives us a little bit uh, added layer of protection uh, from you know any moisture that might be wind driven or whatever. So 
that is the last little piece of fascia right there. So now we can put our gable on. Greg, give yourself a, a clap, man. Or maybe that's, maybe that's who that was for. Yeah, it wasn't for you. Okay, fair enough. All right, so we talked about how the fact that this block here is not necessarily because we're trying to protect our building from getting water inside of it. Like, that's not going to happen. It's here for mainly like an air uh, to stop the wind out here in the country. Obviously, condensation is also a, a key factor in, you know, maybe having it there because if this is heated in the future, that warm air might make its th way through. And something to note is that we used to run it to the top core or the bottom core of our truss, which is right here. And we've actually um, tried to improve by going one more web up. So one more row because this gets blown in with insulation. And one time we had to do a repair job. You remember this, Craig? Mm -hmm. And uh, we tore the steel off in the middle of the winter when the shop was heated. And where that insulation was up against our uh, steel, there was condensation. So that is just because the warmth was traveling through the insulation. It doesn't matter how, many, how much insulation you have, there is always going to be some form of a loss. And so by running the block it up, the goal is when this blow in comes into the ceiling here in the attic and goes against this outside wall, this block it is a barrier and gonna prevent that condensation from building up on the metal. That's the thought because we realized when we went down below the where the, the, the block it was, there wasn't the condensation. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you live and learn and that's why we don't mess with this up here because there was no condensation up on the, on the steel above the block it. It was just where the insulation was laying against the wall. So properly ventilating your attic space will reduce a lot of that, but you still have the potential where warm surfaces meet cold surfaces, so. That's why we don't. That's why we don't waste time uh, putting house wrap up on the gable. We don't find the value in it. But I'm curious. Do you guys think that uh, that is a crazy way to look at it? And the cost of the house wrap, the time and the labor, is worth a potential. I don't even know the the case where you might get some condensation there. I've never seen it. I'm just curious. I don't know. All right, so that kind of wraps up a lot of the miscellaneous items that we had to take care of. Uh, definitely nice to have Greg back, and actually, I'm going to leave him now. I'm going to go on a little short, a little trip with the family for a little summer vacay for a couple days, and Greg is going to stay behind and do some more tasks by himself. So we're going to go ahead and just run this right into Greg taking care of some of the miscellaneous tasks. And Greg, I wish you good luck. And guys, make sure that uh, you hit that thumbs up if Greg does a good job. Because I know when I get back, I will be giving him either a thumbs up or a thumbs down, a.k.a. he doesn't know it yet, but he's just not going to get paid if he doesn't do a good job. So let's hope it. Hey, buddy. If you do a good job, you're going to get some good thumbs up. So let's get into Greg working by himself for a little bit. Hmm? What? You just got to do a good job, dude, and everything will be fine. There's nothing to worry about. Kyle likes doing two at a time. I'm more of like a, a one at a time kind of guy, but since Kyle's not here today, in memory of Kyle, we'll put two in at a time. Undertuck this girl. Oh, you know what? That worked out better than I thought it was going to. Who needs Kyle? That was easy. Okay, she can mark the bottom. Look at that. 
nice tight corner on your fascia. Yeah, looks good. Now that that's done, we're gonna move to the front and do the steel above the, uh, the garage door. All right, first thing I wanna do is check my measurement here so I know which piece I'm starting with. And it looks like it's gonna be around that eight foot seven range. Hmm. Yeah, so Kyle did something weird with the end wall steel, so I don't quite understand what he has planned. So I'll text him, I'm waiting for him to text me back but while we're waiting for that, we're gonna go up in these trusses and those long angled bracing in the trusses, we gotta stiffen those up. So what we're gonna do is just like our wind ties, we're gonna get some two by fours, we're gonna nail them, nail them all together on eight foot increments and stiffen that up because that's what the truss manufacturer calls for. So let's get into that. Battery's about about dead. Hey Kyle, while you're in the trailer, can you uh, can you grab me a Makita battery, please? Thanks. Hopefully he gets it for me. Hello. What is this thing? Remember when times were simple and it was just a pencil? Now it's pencil sharpener and lead dispenser. Crazy. Missed the good old days. Never mind. I'll just get in my get it myself. Where is it at? I can't find the battery nor Kyle. I don't know what I'm gonna do. All right. Let's go do some web framing, and uh, hopefully Kyle will be back by then. We'll see. All right. So you see here we got these green tags for our permanent lateral resistance and diagonal bracing required. So what we're going to do is just like our wind ties here that lock in all of our bottom cords on eight foot centers. We're going to do the same thing up here to stiffen up these angle bracings. That's mainly for snow load. So when the snow gets up there, it starts putting weight on the roof. Um, a lot of times when there's weight, it will like to buckle out this bracing. So we're going to lock it in with some two by fours and uh, yeah, be good and strong when those winter months come. Let's send this on eight foot. Pop a couple nails in it. Lock it in from truss to truss and then we're off to the races. Hey Kyle, can you cut me a bigger block for this? Actually, you know what? I think this will work. Never mind. This should work. Ah. Uh, Hey, Kyle. Kyle, I need a strip of nails. I don't know where he's at. Hey, Michael, can you uh, hand me a strip of nails right there? I left them on the ground. Thanks, buddy. I don't care what Kyle says about you. I think you're a pretty great guy. Good thing you're here. I need, well, to start, I need a eight foot six on the short point. So I can only use two piece. No, too shy. screw off the top, get this whole gable end done, come in, slide in all of our J underneath, and then we're off to the races. We'll finish 
up the rest of the steel up to where we got to put the porch in. And then when Kyle gets back, we'll probably do some porch roofing and we'll finish this wall and there'll be the, all the exterior steel on the outside.